936, and i got to end on time because we got butterflies. If you have never seen our butterfly release, it's, it's amazing, one of my favorite things of the year. Uh, but we're going to draw three names and give away some chocolate for any of our ladies. If you didn't register, you got to stay for next service now. <clears throat> you want to draw one? Okay. I need three total. How many you got? I got one. You got one? I got one. All right, take somebody. You know, we got things to do today. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. All right. How fast can we give away chocolate? Oh, look at this. Nancy Culifer. Thank you very much. Carl, you don't get any of that. I'm just teasing. You have whatever she you have whatever she will give you. Kristen Phillips. Now, it says Kristen instead of Kirsten. So did somebody fill this out for you? Is that what happened? Okay. I was like, she's not Kristen, but thank you, Kirsten. Somebody must have done that for you. You must have said no, and they said yes. That's the kind of people we are. Joanne Weeble. Where's Joanne? Oh, there she is back in the corner. Joanne, how are you? It's good to see you. Your buddy's out of the hospital, you know. All right, good to see you. Sorry, I have random information that nobody has any idea what I'm talking about. It's always a good start. Well, ladies, listen. Let me tell you something I know about Mother's Day. I know it's a hard day for a lot of people. And uh, churches sometimes make it worse. I'll be honest with you. Uh, here's what I want you to know. Whether you have actual children or not, so many of you are an example to so many others. And many of you have gone out of your way for other people. Um, one of my best friends, his wife, uh, Jackie Brantley, uh, would tell you her aunt raised her. Her aunt, who didn't have children of her own, invested in her life. And so, ladies, we just want to honor you today. And so I just want to take a moment just to thank all of our ladies for being just wonderful. We love you guys and appreciate you. Don't let anybody tell you that Jesus didn't care about women. You know who the first preachers were after the resurrection? Women. I hate to tell you that, you know, but uh, write that one down. And uh, I'll be getting a phone call later this week about that one. All right, here we go. James 2, 26. We're going to continue our series today. We're going to talk about James chapter Three today, my least favorite. And the good news is I have less time, so it's going to go really quick. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Today we're going to talk about the power of words. And uh, we're going to talk about why words have power. And one of the most powerful things that you have are the things that you say. And you can encourage, you can influence, you can bless or you can criticize, you can tear down. And one of the things I've learned over the years is words really do matter. And who you hang around and whether or not you participate in gossip and other things can really influence you. Now, this is uh, my son when he wrestled and when he played basketball, he had a few million of these. And if you don't know what these are, these are called mouth guards. It is the totally wrong name for what this is. Because if this were a mouth guard, then when I got around certain people that I tend to want to say things to, I could just go, good to see you. Oh, what a blessing to see you, right? These are teeth guards. But wouldn't it be nice, you know, in the Old Testament it says, God put a guard over my mouth. Wouldn't it be nice... If when you got ready to say something, instead of your brain not engaging and your lips engaging first, if somehow you had just a little, whoa. -oh. But all of us have had a moment. Well, let me just see. Has anybody had a moment where you wish you could withdraw something you just said? Yeah. Yeah, we've all had those moments. I had one yesterday. It was very exciting. A friend of mine called to tell me how excited he was about getting married. And I wanted to let him know I'm excited. I'm, I'm happy for your marriage. And he told me where he was getting married. And instead of saying, I think that's great, I tried to be funny. <laughs> and I said, at least it's not Taco Bell or Walmart. 
which he took as me saying that where he was getting married was bad, and he said, you're very funny. And I realized there was no coming out of what I just said, and there was no, it was just one of those that's just out there, and you go, no. But the truth for all of us is not only have we misspoken, we've sometimes spoken on purpose and said things that we wish we hadn't said and, and said things that were powerful and powerfully wrong. Now, for those of you who know my mom, you know my mom is a southern mom, so I have a few things that she has said to us over the years. My favorite, of course, is bless your heart. Now, most people say to me, well, bless your heart is negative. No, no, no. You need to realize it depends on when she says it and how. So sometimes bless your heart can mean, boy, you're an idiot. Sometimes it can mean, I don't like what that person just did. And sometimes it literally can mean, thank you so much. It's the same words with different meaning. It depends on what it's said. My favorite always as a child was wait till your father gets home. Another very southern one that I think all of you have probably heard by now. You're getting a little too big for your britches. Which if you don't know what that means, it means you were begin being arrogant and thinking you were somebody you were not. Another favorite for me is you kids are eating us out of house and home. I never understood why we needed house and home. House is probably plenty to eat somebody out of, but if you eat them out of home too, I guess that's even worse. You kids are eating us out of house and home. I don't know how that was different. But my favorite, well, my other favorite that I got in trouble many times for, for this one, because my mother would say to my brother and I, you boys don't be ugly, which meant, you know, don't be doofy or whatever. And, and the truth is, we would then make ugly faces, uh, and she, we usually got in trouble for that. She'd say, don't be ugly, and we'd go, right? My favorite, though, that no one has ever heard, I, my mother made this up. When my sister Tracy, she thought she was being a little too big for her britches, my mom would say, who do you think you are, Lady Astor? Now, you've got to realize this was before the Internet. We had no idea who Lady Astor was, and it wasn't in the encyclopedia, <laughs> Right? And apparently she's some woman who thought she was somebody she was not. And so my mom would say that to my sister and we'd all go, Who do you think you are, Lady Astor? But the good news is, Lady Astor apparently was very important in my mom's life. Now let me tell you a few things. Number one, words influence lives. Here we go, James chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. So James in this chapter starts out with this idea of if you're going to teach God's word, you need to realize that you need to be careful how you teach it because you're going to be judged more strictly. But he doesn't stay there with the idea of just pastors or teachers. He goes from there to letting us know that we all need grace. Listen to what he says next. We all stumble in many ways. You should memorize that passage. That passage should be part of your life. You know why? Because we can sometimes tend to think we're better than other people. And James includes himself in this and says, we all stumble. Maybe you don't stumble like this, but we all stumble. And he doesn't just go with stumbling. He says, in many ways. One of the best things I ever heard was somebody saying, I'm just trying to stumble forward. Right? So, so you mess up and you get back up and you say, God, forgive me. And we go Forward. Now, you got to realize, it says next, if anyone is never at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. What's James saying? We're not perfect. I'm sure James remembered going to get his brother Jesus, basically thinking that he was crazy, and he and mom and the brothers went to get Jesus, and that's when Jesus says, who are my mother and brothers? Basically, they were coming to take him away. Ho, ho, ha, ha, he, he. And James, I'm sure, remembers that and goes, oh, what was I thinking when I said that? And then he continues. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. we got people who ride horses here. And man, they can turn that whole animal with just a little, little thing. Just a little thing. And yet, listen to what it says. Although they're large, and, uh, and then it says, or take ships for an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they're steered... By a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants to go. 
See, the first part talks about pastors, and it's one of the reasons I'm really careful who I let come up here. I don't just, somebody shows up for church, and one of the funniest things that happens, it happens all the time, is people show up, never have been to our church. They show up for the first time, they walk up to me, and Dave has watched this over and over again. They walk up to me and go, Pastor, if you're ever gone, I'll be glad to take your place. This is somebody I don't know. I have no idea about their character. I don't know any idea about their background, any idea about their teaching, and they think that I'm going to go, oh, man, yeah, I'm tired. Just get up here and say whatever. You, you, I mean, you might talk about blue crystals and Yoda. I have no idea, right? Right? So what do I do? I have to be careful. I have to know who is going to be up here. Why? Because James warns about that. And then he says, man, I mess up in what I say. You know, so, so often we can control other things. It'd be so nice to have a true mouth guard. And by the way, this is why we need the Holy Spirit in our lives to wake us up, to make us more aware of the things we say, to realize the power in our words, to understand that the things that we say matter. In Matthew 15, Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when you say something, you should, instead of worrying so much about what you say, you should say, where did that come from? And then confess about your heart. In Matthew 12, Jesus says this, I tell you on judgment day, people will be responsible for every careless thing they have said. Careless is thoughtful or un, uh, not thoughtful or hurtful. The words you said will be used to judge you. Some of your words will prove you right, but some of your words will prove you guilty. I was at a church years ago, years ago, and there were about three people in that church that were masters at gossip that sounded spiritual. Have you ever experienced gossip that sounds spiritual? You know, I just love Brother Eric, but he is off his rocker, right? What he said last week just went, you know, Sue, Sally Sue, we just need to pray for her. She just mean to her children, right? And these people would not only do that, they would do things about the church. So anytime they didn't like something that went on in the church, you pray for our pastor, he thinks that these new choruses are good, and we just we know they're not from Jesus. And these same people would sit down. When the church would stand up to sing, they would stay seated to show that they were defying the new songs. By the way, there's a verse that talks about songs, hymns, and spiritual songs, just so you know. I'm glad you like hymns, but if you really want to go back to the old days, you need to go back to Gregorian chants. Everybody says, well, I like the old songs. And I'm like, man, me too. In Monte Olivetti. What are you talking about? Not that old. Oh, so you like the songs that you like that are old, not the songs that are really old. And then they go, I hate repetitive choruses. You're right, me too. That hallelujah chorus, they just say the same thing over. No, no, I'm not talking about the hallelujah. I'm talking about all these new ones. Wait, wait, wait. So the hallelujah chorus isn't repetitive? Oh, no, that's repetitive too, but that's okay. What? See, we tend to complain about the things that are our preferences, and we use our gossip, and we even use prayer requests if we're not careful, what? To hurt other people, to make ourselves look better, to get our opinion out there and pretend we're spiritual. Can I tell you about that church now? It's less than one-eighth the size it was when I was there. And when I talked to the last pastor, you know what he said to me? You know, Eric, we've got three people at this church that if they would just change what they say, it would change our church. Just broke my heart. Did you know most churches it takes three people to get rid of the pastor? Can I tell you one of my favorite things about our church? And I have made people mad by saying this, but I'm going to tell you anyway, okay? I love that gossips hate our church. I love it that complainers try to complain and other people go, I don't think that. And they're like, oh i got to go somewhere else to church where I can complain about the pastor. i got to go somewhere else to church where I can complain about everything. And they come here and they complain, and everybody just looks at them and goes, yeah, we've been doing that forever. I, there's probably other churches that would do that. Are you telling me to go somewhere else? Well, if you're unhappy, right? I love that about our church. Gossips, negative people are uncomfortable at our church. This is my favorite part of our church. As a, listen, talk to any pastor and say, what's your least favorite part of the church? And they'll tell you. It's somebody who's meh, 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 all the time. Number two, words can't be withdrawn. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boast. By the way, most of the time you say something wrong, it comes out of arrogance, out of pride. 
You think the way you think is better than somebody else. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. I had an uncle who did a control burn one time. It ended up to be 150 acres. It was controlled, right? But you've done worse things with your mouth than my uncle did with Ocala. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. By the way, if you haven't had a moment where you went, why did I say that? You, 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 you will. <laughs> it corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and it itself is set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no one can tame the tongue. Why? It's a restless evil full of deadly po poison. Don't you think James is remembering some things he said? Don't you think James is realizing that it's so important what we say that we need to pay attention to the words that come out of our mouth? You can run somebody into the ground by what you say, or you can lift them up and encourage and bless them. My mother was so good at this as a kid. As a kid, I was always hyper. They didn't have ADD back then. They just had belts. I was paddled three times in first grade. First grade, seven years old, I kept getting paddled. Right? Hard. Not, not easy paddling. Hard. And when I'd come home, my mom would say to me, Honey, I know you have so much potential. She didn't see what I had done that day. She saw what the future could be. She spoke into what could happen, who I could be. She went to bless me when other people pushed me down. In Ephesians 4, it says this, Then we will no longer, this is what a mature Christian looks like, we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. And then it says this, Instead, what does a mature Christian look like? Speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. So a Christian doesn't just lie to people, oh, I think you're wonderful. Oh, my goodness gracious, right? A Christian speaks the truth, but they do it in love. And this word for truth here is this really cool word. It means literally truthing. And it can even mean reality, and it can go as far as what reality could be. That's what my mom did. You have potential. Boy, you could do school if you put your mind to it. That's what would happen when I came home with my report card. Right? Because she believed I could do it. And guess what? I started to believe I could do it too. So I got my double major in college, and then I got my master's degree, and then I got my doctorate degree. When everybody else said, this boy can't pay attention to anything. My mom said, you can do anything if you put your heart to. Do you have anybody that encourages you? Even bigger question, who do you encourage? Who have you told you see the potential in them? Who do you tell the truth in love of what could be if God continued to work in their lives? Number three, our words represent Christ. Years ago, my mom was at a church called Flagler Street in Miami. My dad, my grandfather actually laid the block for Flagler Street. My dad later laid the block for another church called Wayside Baptist in Miami. Has a different name now. When she was at Flagler Street, she was taking my brother to the nursery one day, and this was about the time a lot of Cubans were coming to Miami. And the lady in charge of the nursery, as my wa mom walked in, was given a Hispanic child, and she took that Hispanic child, and she threw the Hispanic child in the crib and said these words, I don't know why those people think they can bring their children here. My mom was so upset, she never again dropped my brother off in the nursery. Not only that, she went to the next business meeting where they decided that they would separate and put the Hispanic kids in a different nursery, she said, that should not be true. I talked to my mom about this just a few days ago, and she said, you know, Eric, that church had to close because they didn't embrace 
the community around them and love the people around them. And it started with, I don't know why those people have to leave their children here. My mom always said, God doesn't like ugly. Right? So what's happened now? The good news is there is a huge, thriving Hispanic church where Flagler Street used to be. And the block that my grandfather laid are still there housing people who are coming to Christ day after day. With our tongues we praise the Lord and Father and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? The answer is no, by the way. My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can salt a salt spring produce fresh water. And I have this conversation with couples all the time. And a lot of times it's husbands and they come to me and they say, I'm, you know, I've done so much to build my wife up, to encourage my wife. And I just said this one thing. And then they tell me what they said. And I went, who? You said what? I said, that's like fertilizing and watering a rose bush and going, oh, I just, this rose bush is great. And taking care of it and clipping it. And then you take gasoline and go, oh, I don't think this will matter. And then saying, I'm really sorry about the gasoline. Your words have power. I tell couples all the time, <laughs> I say, you realize when somebody says to you, tell me what's on your mind, that you don't have to. <laughs> Especially when what's wandering around in your mind is not from God. That's why it says, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Not everything that wanders around in your mind is a correct thought. Did you know that? Write that down. <laughs> Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, I love this, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Boy, wouldn't we speak better if we had all those things? But listen to what it says next, and people misunderstand this. Bear with each other. This word for bear doesn't mean put up with. Too often we say, well, I just tolerate so-and-so. No, no. This word for bear in the Greek means to lift up. Do you know difficult people? Instead of putting up with them, lift them up. You know, a kid who's struggling, go out of your way. to. How can you lift them up? Well, you know what? Number one is pray for them. Teddy Roosevelt talked about how the prayers of mothers were the things that held our nation together. Bear with each other. Forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. That's a pretty high standard. And over all these virtues, what do you put on? Put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. I want to end with one story. Some of you in this room have had bypass surgery. And the first bypass surgery, let me see if I can get this guy's name, was a guy named Michael DeBakey. And what he did is he was working on the heart and he was looking at different things. And he realized he could help to make a bypass valve or at least a bypass sleeve. When he was a kid, his mom had taught him to knit and to sew.